Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the ASNIC Nuclear Cardiology Virtual Elective. Uh, I'm pleased uh, to introduce Dr. Randy Thompson, who is the president-elect of the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology, and he's an attending physician in cardiology at the Mid-America Heart Institute. Today is day five of the session. We still have five more days uh, next week. And the topic of discussion for today is going to be hybrid spec CT and PET CT imaging. So thank you all for joining. Hey, Randy, you're up. Thank you for speaking, Randy. Well, thank you, thank you. And welcome everyone to uh, day five of our uh, Read with the Experts Nuclear Cardiology Reading Session. Uh, I have an announcement that Sarah Maholtra asked us to make. Um, there's a new initiative with the Journal of Nuclear Cardiology called uh, Fellows Corner. Uh, and this is open to anyone who's interested. Usually you would write an editorial style submission uh, with an attending, but uh, uh, trainees and early career professional professionals are welcome to submit something. Uh, in the bottom of the slide is uh, Saurabh's email address. If you have uh, interest or have questions about it, uh, please um, uh, direct them to him. Saurabh. Our uh, topic today is hybrid spec CT and PET CT imaging. I'm going to show a few slides about this, uh, and then uh, we'll go through some cases, both spec cases and PET cases. Uh, the, uh, there'll be opportunity to ask questions and for some of the people to read them. Uh, the first uh, oh, uh, 45 minutes or so will be going pretty quickly, uh, mostly just uh, uh, simple points on some interesting cases. Uh, these are my uh, co-participants today, Dr. Spret Berry, Brett Spiri. Uh, is one of our colleagues. He's a heart failure expert. You may have heard him at ASNIC speaking about uh, heart failure and uh, amyloid and sarcoid. He has certain expertise in that. He's going to share some cases. And also one of our fellows in training, uh, Krishna Patel. Krishna won the uh, ASNIC Research Award in 2018. Uh, and uh, she'll be uh, chiming in. We'll, we'll ask her the hard questions when we get to some. Uh, on Thursday uh, next week, uh, two of my other colleagues, Tim Bateman and Ian McGee, will be speaking, uh, giving a webinar about cardiac PET uh, MPI. Uh, I'll go into less detail about PET uh, since they're going to be uh, speaking about it uh, very soon. So one of the fun things about uh, this series, I believe, is seeing other people's labs, sort of seeing inside and how some of the people around the country read their cases and and uh, what kind of equipment they use and what they show. This is a picture of our lab here. Uh, James Case, many of you may know on the uh, far left side there, uh, one of our, is our physicist. Uh, Kevin Bybee, one of a, a very good nuclear reader that's part of our lab. And then three of our techs who are uh, in the processing room, they we process centrally all the uh, scans done in the enterprise. Uh, Eric Burgett uh, uh, and uh, Molly, uh, they're in the room with us today. Here's uh, Tim Bateman, here's me, here's Ibrahim Seed, uh, multimodality imager, nuclear cardiology, and cardiac MR. And uh, poorly photoshopped in is uh, James O'Keefe. I've actually um, heard that Dr. O'Keefe is famous amongst fellows in training because of his EKG book. They use it for uh, setting for the boards. Uh, but he's one of our uh, major participants in our uh, laboratory. Um, I think there's some international folks on the, uh, the call. If so, uh, they may not know where Kansas City is. It's right in the middle of the United States. Kansas City was the host for the ASNIC 2017 meeting, and um, uh, we like it here. Uh, we're, uh, those of you who do know Kansas City, we're right next to uh, Country Club Plaza, one of the kind of cool areas of town. Uh, Kansas City has two of the top five museums in the nation, the Nelson Atkins Museum and the nation's World War I uh, uh, Memorial. Uh, it's the city of fountains. We have more fountains than any city outside of Rome. We also have more uh, uh, miles of highway per capita than any other big city in the world. So we have some of the uh, less traffic than almost every other city in, around. We're also known for barbecue, uh, which gives us a, a more than a, a above average experience in imaging obese patients and very obese patients, but we don't have the market corner of that one, of course, at all. Uh, here's where our four metropolitan hospitals are. Uh, we, do, we have PET and SPEC at each of these four centers. Uh, we bring them in centrally to that room that you saw the picture of the uh, Kansas City Chiefs uh, gear on. 
um, and uh, they're processed there and read there. We also have five uh, regional hospitals, actually hospitals in rural areas. Most of those scanners are spec CT machines. Uh, those kind of uh, critical access hospitals need backup CT scanners and hence they, uh, they use uh, that and we, we read those centrally as well. Just backing up to this picture here. Um, so the ASNIC uh, uh, communication people said, well, with the Super Bowl coming up, why don't we have a, an ASNIC team chiefs and an ASNIC team uh, 49ers? And so I was captain of the, of the ASNIC team chiefs and uh, the captain of the 49ers ASNIC team was Greg Thomas. And since the Chiefs won, I got the privilege of donating $500 to the ASNIC fund, which I didn't mind to do. And, and Greg used to wear a hat at the ASNIC meeting, uh, uh, Kansas City Chiefs hat. So if you see Greg didn't have his hat on, please ask him uh, where his hat is. I'll wear the hat, Randy. All right, glad Greg's on. <laughs> um, here's the instrumentation that we have. Uh, um, we have uh, some anchor cameras, uh, spec cameras with line source. They all have uh, attenuation correction, also advanced post-processing with um, uh, the, uh, the Philips of uh, uh, proprietary software, Astonish. We also have uh, two uh, D-Spec CZT cameras. Uh, these, uh, for these, we do have, for some of them, uh, the ability to do uh, C CT attenuation correction from a CT that's obtained um, separately. Uh, we also have uh, a spec CT camera, several that are on the, in the the regional critical access country hospital, small town hospitals, uh, but one here that's uh, advancing. Quite frankly, we use this mostly for niches, uh, for very obese patients, for example, or for the uh, amyloid cases, for, uh, for example. Uh, we've not been able to get the radiation dose down as low with this camera as we have with the others, but uh, it, is, it does uh, serve a very important niche. Now we've got PET CT cameras at all four of the metropolitan hospitals, including a a uh, new digital PET CT camera that we're very excited about. It's really just superb image quality. Uh, if if you have a twice the spatial resolution with PET over spec, with a digital PET uh, system, you've got uh, twice the spatial resolution or half the, the resolution, if you will, compared to a regular PET scammer. So the image quality is amazing. Uh, this camera also can take very obese patients up to the weight limit of the table. Um, but I'm sure Dr. Bateman and Dr. Nigi will show you more of that. Uh, on next Thursday, so I'll not be talking about that so much. <clears throat> Here's um, one of the uh, types of cameras we have, and I'll show you some cases from this. So it's a spec with a scanning line source attenuation correction. This is from an older technologies. It is paired with some advanced post-processing. Uh, and the cases we show with this is the, uh, the one um, type of equipment in nuclear cardiology where the, uh, there's not a misregistration issue. The, uh, the, the emission and transmission images are obtained exactly the same time. The camera does the stops and there's a, it takes uh, two pictures, one from the uh, gadolinium source, one from the emission source in the patient. Uh, here are some of the transmission images you see. They're, they're not CT uh, quality, but you sometimes can see uh, like a mass here if it's uh, big enough. Uh, here's the picture of the CZT, the D-spec camera that we have. This chair uh, lays flat and then uh, goes upright as you see here. So in these cases, the patient gets uh, two sets of images. It's akin to having a, a prone image um, with a supine image. Here you have an upright and a, uh, up, sitting upright and a supine image. Uh, here's our spec CT cameras. I mentioned we use this mostly for obese patients in certain niches. And here's the picture of the digital uh, PET scanner. Uh, uh, very exciting, very good image quality with this uh, above and beyond uh, the excellent image quality you get with regular uh, cardiac pe uh, pet. <clears throat> Here's the generator that's eluding you sort of see the orientation of it. I assume that Dr. Bateman and McGee talk a little more about that next Thursday. So <clears throat> the focus of our lab, if you will, I'd, I'd like to see that sort of labs have personalities and do things in a big way. We, for the last 10 years, have gone all out minimizing radiation dose. I'll show you some slides on that. Um, uh, you can get uh, through contemporary protocols and equipment, very low radiation dose. Um, I think more people want to do that. We also do calcium scoring with every diagnostic PET or SPEC study. And I'll advocate for that and uh, perhaps have some uh, discussion because I know certain parts of the country don't quite see it that way. 
Dr. Bateman, in a case of then develop, developers and early adopters of pet flow, uh, we do that routinely now as well, and then with Dr. Sperry's amyloid imaging. So uh, let me start off with a case, and I'll ask uh, Krishna to uh, comment here. Um, he's brought into the observation ward for atypical chest pain. He's got a history of smoking, but he's otherwise been healthy. Uh, the cardiac enzymes are negative. The EKG shows minor changes, and the hospitalist sees him. He really thinks this is atypical chest pain, but since he was admitted to the hospital, he thought that uh, a stress test ought to be done. Uh, and here's the stress test. Uh, uh, Krishna, would you say that looks pretty normal? Yes. She's, she's nodding in the background. She said, yes. Yeah. So it is, so it's a nice normal study. You know, this is a kind of the kind of case you see uh, every day. Um, it was pharmacologic stress with rigodenosin. We did think he responded to rigodenosin. Uh, had some mild symptoms, the heart rate went up, the blood pressure went up slightly. Uh, there were some EKG changes at rest, but no real changes uh, or arrhythmias with testing. And so you're ready to rule this out as a normal study, but here the calcium score is 3,457. So uh, what does that make you think? Uh, do you have any, uh, Chris, do you have any comments on that? How you might treat this differently? Certainly makes it a high risk um, study given uh, the extent so calcification in pretty much, I mean, I don't know how the RCA looks, but the LAD circ, even left, I mean, everything, there's yeah. a lot of calcium everywhere. So um, no, I wouldn't be that comfortable just passing it off as a yeah. completely Dr. normal study. Dr. Patel has done some very nice work looking at our database and helping us figure out how to um, uh, interpret these kind of scans when there's discordant data between the calcium scoring, the flow, and the, the static perfusion. Well, let me, here's the question I pose, and people can uh, answer in the, the chat box. At this point, uh, the hospitalist should A, tell the patient everything's fine and follow up with his PCP if the chest pain comes back. In other words, he's fine. B, go tell him to go see a cardiologist as an outpatient. C, tell him he needs to wait in the hospital for a cardiology consult. Or D, forget the cardiologist needs to see a cardiac surgeon right away. Grace is going to tell me how people are responding. Everybody says C. Everyone says C, yeah. I'd say A, a might not be unreasonable, but uh, certainly uh, A is not correct, and uh, that can happen. I, and and uh, when there's discordant data between the static perfusion and the, uh, the CT or the, or the flows, um, I found that uh, uh, the average internist, the average nurse practitioner, kind of defaults to the static perfusion. And so I, I use this case to, um, uh, as, to change my practice. Uh, here's what happened. And the patient was lost to follow up. We heard from him a few months later uh, when he contacted the hospital administrator. He wanna, didn't want to pay his bill because he uh, had some more chest pain, went to another hospital where they did a cath and, uh, and a bypass operation. So that's, that's uh, not a very good outcome. But since certainly since I, I get on the horn and call the attending cardiologist or maybe the cardiac fellow, uh, when there's discordance like this, when, you're, uh, when, you're when I'm concerned that uh, the study might be a false negative, might, there's some some folks that would say, well, if, if someone has chest pain and a calcium score this high, maybe skip the uh, perfusion study and just uh, uh, do a cardiac cath based on the, the high, very high pretest likelihood. Uh, this fellow had atypical symptoms. His symptoms might even have changed. Um, this is why, of course, um, with uh, uh, high coronary calcium scores, the uh, all-cause event goes up. Uh, here is a thousand, you see, as from a well travel slide from uh, Leslie Shaw. Um, this fellow had a calcium score of 3,000. Uh, here's one uh, study that's a bit old, but it's rather striking that uh, for patients who had a calcium score of over 1,000 who uh, came into the hospital, the event rate, you know, uh, uh, MI or, uh, or death or need for urgent revascularization was 25% at one year, so really quite high. So again, this patient should not have been treated um, like he was fine. Uh, here's uh, more data, uh, also uh, usually or frequently presented. Uh, this is from a study by Ching, the Journal of American College of Cardiology. Uh, for patients who have uh, MPI and coronary calcium scoring, there's complementary information. Uh, here are patients who uh, have, here's total cardiac events on the left and, and all cause death MI on the right. Folks that have a calcium score over 400 have much more events. Uh, this on the left was normal MPI. Uh, here on the, the next slide is 
broken out by normal MPI versus an abnormal MPI. Patients who had a normal MPI and a calcium score of 1,000 have substantially more events as those who uh, have a normal MPI and calcium score less than 1,000. Almost as many events as those who have ischemia and a calcium score less than 1,000. And uh, here's a little, a little more just making the point. When you add coronary calcium scoring to myocardial diffusion imaging, you improve the incremental prognostic value. Your ROC curves improve, uh, dark, ye dark yellow here. Uh, and uh, another, st another one from changing the long-term events rate in patients who have low-risk treadmill tests. I, this comes up actually fairly frequently. The, radio, the radiologic benefits managers uh, would like us to do a treadmill test instead of a, uh, an exercise spec study that I might have ordered. So we'll do a, a treadmill test, maybe plus a calcium score. Um, if the calcium score is high, and the even if the treadmill is low risk, uh, these people have a lot of events. So there's obviously a lot of incre uh, incremental prognostic value here. That's why we do this routinely. And some other places uh, do this as well. Uh, Dr. Almala spoke yesterday and he uh, showed similar cases. So here I'll, I'll ask a question and see what people think, kind of uh, pose. Should we obtain coronary calcium score routinely in patients undergoing outpatient diagnostic MPI exams? Uh, yes or no? I'll give it 60 seconds. Yes. Okay. How, how are people responding to this question? A. Yeah, everyone says A. Well, uh, this is, um, I think most of the cardiologists in the United States are coming around. There are camps, uh, especially on the East Coast, where coronary calcium, calcium scoring is kind of out of favor. A couple of questions have come up, and I, I'll address those um, uh, briefly. One, one was, uh, how do you calculate a calcium score from a PET CT exam? Um, and uh, what was the other one, Krishna? It is. Drop in EF. Oh, drop in EF. Yeah. So in that case we presented, uh, he did not have a drop in EF. Uh, the flows were me measured, but it was uh, there were technically suboptimals that were not included. So I would say the answer to my question is yes, but I'll, I'll put a couple of provid provisos here. Providing uh, you're going to do something with the information, uh, which means that you believe that uh, uh, you, that the data is, should be extrapolated and that preventive measures would work in these kind of patients that have a high coronary calcium. The radiation dose is low. Some of the older equipment takes a higher radiation dose. It should be able to do a calcium score on less than a millisievert. Uh, and the cost is modest. We charge uh, $50. Uh, sometimes hospital administrators are reluctant to, uh, to go with such an inexpensive price. Uh, the cost of the study is more than, the cost of the service is more than $100. Uh, but uh, when you're, when you're going to charge someone four hundred dollars, then the calculus here is a bit different. Uh, here's some uh, data we uh, and others have accumulated. When you do a coronary calcium score on top of a normal MPI, uh, the rate of patients having a calcium score over one hundred is somewhere between uh, seventeen point five percent and fifty six percent. One hundred being kind of an arbitrary number, but uh, one where we say, well, at that level, we uh, ought to start people on statins, perhaps aspirin. Uh, there's enough disease there to, um, enough atherosclerotic plaque to be worth uh, those maneuvers. Um, <clears throat> this uh, sort of, I think, speaks to one of the questions that was being asked. Um, we get a formal coronary calcium score. So with a, a PET study and with a SPEC CT scan, you have a low dose attenuation map. And so instead of an MA, excuse me, a KV of 120, it's the KV of say 10 or 15, and it's not gated. And it's not uh, done to the, through the algorithm where you would be able to get a calcium score and, and apply the, the number you get uh, to the huge database that we have on calcium scoring. So what about just looking at the calcium on the CT attenuation map rather than scoring it through a, an extra acquisition of one millisievert uh, gated scan? Well, you can do that and it, it, is, it is a value. Uh, here's a study that came out in Jack, uh, excuse me, CERC Imaging uh, very recently. Uh, this is from the Intermountain Health. They had a nice large number, over 11,000 patients. Uh, they looked at the calcium score uh, during PET scans uh, in patients without known 
coronary disease and looked at events and SAMHSA had helped them. Now uh, here's the uh, adjusted hazard ratio of calcium score absent versus present, the top uh, curve. Uh, and those who had no visible uh, coronary calcium, the rate of coronary angiography, the rate of hydrate obstruction, and the rate of revascularization were all lower and lower. Um, here's this is uh, blown up as you see. Um, you uh, can train your eye to look at the calcium score on these non-gated lower dose studies. Uh, here's a, a study we did with Andrew Einstein 10 years ago where uh, three groups did both coronary calcium score and looked at the low dose attenuation map. Uh, and the, you, you can train your eyes, you can get pretty good at it. Uh, here's on the top, visually estimated coronary calcium. On the left, the diagonal score. And this diagonal line is the line of agreement. And you see the line of agreement is pretty good. Um, there are some patients that you underestimate the score, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um, here's uh, some images from um, an editorial that Greg Thomas and I uh, published very recently. So uh, I got the invitation to, to make, write an editorial on uh, that uh, Lee study that I showed a moment ago. And that very next day, I had a patient who we were reading the scan, reading a spec study, and just a month before, she had had a coronary calcium score. Now, the coronary calcium score was 121, and on the non-gated uh, spec uh, CT scan, uh, you couldn't see the calcium at all. Now, the BMI is 40, and the KV is 20 instead of 120, but it's not, not visible. So in this person, you would not have seen the coronary calcium. Uh, so the, that's why, or at least we advocate getting a proper calcium score. The reasons you wouldn't, the reasons mostly have to do with cost. Um, the, uh, uh, the cost to have the gated software, oh, is about $50,000. And the cost to have um, uh, the, uh, the calcium scoring computer program is also something like that. So it does cost you extra money to be able to do a proper score rather, rather than just eyeballing uh, the non-gated scan. Um, the, uh, uh, anyway, <clears throat> but we believe it's, it's uh, worth doing that. Now, there also is the issue with hospital administrators. There, there are issues with charging for the uh, calcium score. Now, what we do is we charge everyone $50. Um, uh, if the patient uh, doesn't pay it, we don't go to the mat over it. Uh, and that's at least a, number, a dollar number, at least in the United States, where uh, patients don't seem to complain very much. <clears throat> so in terms of about billing, um, we do have separate billing codes for pet, cardiac PET CT now that started this year. So you bill separately for a, a PET scan performed on a PET CT machine versus a dedicated PET scanner that uses a PET uh, source for the attenuation correction. Um, when, you, when you have those kind of scans, you're supposed to review the CT attenuation map. In fact, it's considered part of the work. If you don't look at those scans, you're not doing uh, the full uh, billable service. There are separate codes for nuclear medicine on a spec CT camera. So there's some nuclear medicine colleagues on the call, and, and that's uh, the SPEC CT system has additional utility in uh, the nuclear medicine world uh, when getting the theranostics and so forth. And uh, for cardiac SPEC, you don't get billed separately for doing a PET uh, SPEC CT scan. We get paid the same amount if you do a SPEC study on an old 20-year-old anger camera without any enhancements, without any uh, CT or, uh, or post-processing or attenuation correction, as you do with a top-of-the-line SPEC, SPEC CT machine. That may uh, change in the near future, though. I'm going to show you some other things that the reason why you need to look at these scans. Here's some incidental cardiac findings that were picked up just uh, uh, in my experience the last couple of years. Uh, here's an aortic aneurysm. Uh, here's a patient that had interstitial lung disease. So the study's done because of shortness of breath to rule out ischemic heart disease. And you pick up another diagnosis of interstitial lung disease, which on the CT scan is more remarkable than the clinician realized uh, it was clinically. Here is a uh, right side pleural effusion and bilateral pleural effusions, uh, often underappreciated on a physical exam. Uh, Krishna, uh, what do you see here? Pericard, hello. Pericardial effusion. Right, so there's a pleural effusion, also a bit of cardiac effusion. Mm -hmm. uh, this patient was uh, short of breath. The test was ordered. We did. We noticed this on the scan, and 
the patient went on for dialysis for the um, uremic uh, pericardial effusion. Uh, here we have Krishna. Hello. Calcification, pericardial calcification. All right, pericardial calcifications. Incidentally uh, noted, the patient had constrictive pericarditis. There's a large hiatal hernia. Uh, sometimes we see pills second hiatal hernias. Uh, the patient had a test because of chest fullness of breath. Uh, <clears throat> these, these kind of findings are relevant, even gallstones. What do you have here? Uh, this is where cardiologists start to get nervous because uh, we're not, uh, we, can, we can see the cardiac diagnoses, but uh, uh, what about uh, uh, picking up breast cancer? Well, we're not really geared toward that. Uh, we now do look uh, for the breast and the lungs and uh, have, uh, we've accumulated enough experience where the cardiologists feel like they can do a screening exam and refer these tests selectively. Uh, some centers feel like they need a radiologist to do an ovary 100% of the time. Um, I think there's probably a need for cardiologists to, to have more practice and screening. If you're a fellow in training, you're planning to go somewhere uh, where you'll be reading on SPECT, uh, CT instrumentation or PET CT instrumentation, and encourage you to spend some time in the radiologist suite with the chest radiologist. In the nuclear medicine world, there's a magic number of 500 uh, CT scans to be viewed to be considered uh, competent. We don't have that in cardiology, at least not yet. Uh, but uh, if you have an opportunity to do that in training, I would uh, consider suggest you consider doing that. Uh, another couple of examples, this is elevated right hemidiaphragm. Again, on exam, it was underappreciated. The test was done for shortness of breath, patient had a chest x-ray. The elevated right hemidiaphragm had something to do with why the test was ordered in the first place. And here's a, um, an atrioceptal occluder, just an incidental finding. Now here's a list of uh, 13 diagnoses, or actually more than that, that you find on the transmission map, the low-dose CT scan, uh, that can be uh, a, a diagnosis that explain why the patient had the test ordered in the first place. Uh, and we can and should look for these. And for the for PET CT, it's part of the work of uh, doing the examination. So I'm going to go to another page. I'm going to change gears now. Yeah. Do you have one question on the contact? Okay, we'll take a, take a question. Go ahead, uh, Krishna. For the panel, can you um, describe what the difference between uh, so the um, the question was about um, the CT for calcium scoring versus the CT for attenuation correction. Um, yeah, thanks for asking me to re-clarify that because I went pretty quickly through it. So with um, a spec CT or a PET CT scan, you don't need a full dose of radiation to get an attenuation map to use for attenuation correction. Uh, that's um, a lower dose scan, like 20 uh, uh, kV. It's not gated. It's not the full uh, chest either, but neither is the calcium score. Uh, and like the scan I showed um, of the patient whose BMI was 40, um, you can make a number, of, make out a number of structures. You make out uh, a lot of the things that I showed, uh, but it's lower resolution. Uh, you don't see fine lung nodules, for example, uh, and you. Uh, uh, you don't get a, a, a proper coronary calcium score. Now, when we do a coronary calcium score, we do we require the CT scan uh, differently. We require a separate acquisition. Uh, the study is gated, the KV is 120, and it's uh, diagnostic quality, but it does not include the whole uh, chest, it includes the over the heart. So if you see lung nodules, we usually recommend that you get a full chest CT scan to see the whole, the whole lung. Um, that, those, those are the major differences, though. Okay, I'm going to change gears and show some cases here um, with some of the uh, different instrumentation that we have in our lab. Here's a 48-year-old woman who had an abnormal EKG, mostly typical pain in a family history of coronary disease. Uh, she was referred for exercise spec study. Uh, it was performed as a stress-only using a high sensitivity camera, a V-spec camera. Uh, here's the EKG, so our radiologic benefits manager might have asked us to do a treadmill test instead. No, she didn't need an imaging study. She's got an abnormal EKG at, start, at, at rest, uh, and it got worse with stress. And here's the, um, the spec on a CZT camera in the supine position. Krishna, you want to comment? Does it look normal to you?
It looks okay. Yeah. I haven't shown you much data, but this is a quick case. It is normal. It should be normal. Um, and the question is, have we answered the clinical question? Well, I'd say yes. So we have a simple question. Uh, you've got exercise capacity, you've got a normal MPI. Uh, you've answered a simple question with a, a simple test, a stress only test. Um, and in this case, we've done it with low radiation dose, very low radiation dose. So a usual spec study, um, uh, say a one day rest stress or stress rest spec study would be a total of uh, about 11 millisieverts, 30 plus 10 or 10 plus 30 millicuries of technetium. Um, this was uh, 2.9 millicuries stress only, low dose stress only, and one millisiever. And now when you get the radiation dose this low, then um, uh, it sort of opens up all kinds of possibilities. It really takes the, changes the conversation. So the advocates for stress echo or stress MR have uh, a little less to advocate for uh, when the radiation dose is this low, so really trivial. And the way you can do it on this solid te state detector uh, camera, you get a million counts. If you give 30 millicuries for the standard uh, stress first dose, you only have to uh, image uh, acquire for about three minutes. We do a three minute supine, three minute upright. Uh, you can also give half that dose, say 14 and image for seven minutes supine and seven minutes sitting upright. Or you can give, do what we do, which is give around four millicuries and we do two acquisitions, 13 minutes and 13 minutes for the stress. So that uh, patients do move around more when you have longer acquisitions. It does uh, make it a little bit more labor intensive for the techs who have to uh, remind and watch the patients not to move. Uh, but it allows you to get very low radiation doses. Uh, in this case, uh, a tenth of the usual radiation dose. So I'll show another patient, also a stress first. A uh, 45-year-old woman had a history of hypertension, an abnormal EKG, complaints of shortness of breath, and she had a stress first MPI. She exercised for very well, 12.8 mets. Uh, here it is. Uh, this is a stress supine. Not quite as normal looking as the other one. Can we look at the upright images? Here's, Here's the rotating images. Uh, you do see breast attenuation there now. On these rotating images on this camera, you're not, you're not going to see motion because of the way this camera does, but you do see breast attenuation there. Uh, here's the black and white. This is uh, a stress supine, a little bit of uh, attenuation anteriorly. Here it is upright. Now, in this case, um, the defect has shifted, right? Here's uh, upright. Uh, the wall motion is normal. Uh, so we got supine and upright here. This is akin to getting a, a prone set of images. With upright and supine, you can see a shifting defect. Um, here it is, uh, supine. Here it is, upright. So um, is, is this normal? Yes, yeah, normal. Just, just, just as if the defect went away on a prone set of images. So now again, we've uh, in this case, we've got very good exercise capacity. We've easily answered the question. We've given a very low radiation dosage. Now, here's another patient who uh, has had stress first. You've got supine and sitting. Um, Krishna, what do you think? Is this, uh, is this attenuation artifact? Now, so this is, both these are stress. This defect is still there. Yeah, atypical defect, which doesn't go away. So this is a severe perfusion defect that was uh, that does not go away. So this patient either has an infarct, in which case you do a resting scan to see how much reversibility there is, or there's um, severe ischemia. Now, um, in this case, we usually would simply get a resting scan to see how much reversibility there is. There are sometimes, however, where a patient does not have known disease. They've got roughly normal looking EKG. They've got normal wall motion. They develop chest pain and EKG changes. You see this defect, you say, well, clearly this is ischemic, not scar. We should, uh, uh, we should just cut right to a cardiac cath or 
uh, move right along here, set again in the rest image. Sometimes it is diagnostic just from the stress only images. Another patient, 66 year old with an abnormal EKG, uh, diabetes and hypertension. He reports some chest discomfort with, with eating. He has a stress exercise MPI. Um, he had to have farm stress because he exercised uh, poorly. And here's our um, uh, stress upright image. Uh, look, is, is there diaphragmatic continuation? There is. If you notice, um, the diaphragm comes up along underneath. So there's clearly diaphragmatic continuation. If you saw that, you wonder is that uh, perfusion defect or is it diaphragmatic continuation? Here it is stress upright. Here it is stress supine. Here it is black and white, stress supine. I think my slide just um, stopped, so I'm going to reload here. So you want to comment on that, uh, Krishna? Hey, Randy, I don't yeah. think we're able to hear Krishna very well. Could you ask her to speak closer into the microphone? Well, Krishna, speak closer to the microphone. Um, so I think there's a question um, uh, to do prone imaging. So we don't do prone imaging because we do supine and upright. So we do do two uh, imaging in uh, two positions. Um, so it looked like there was an inferior defect, which did not change with position. So it is an inferior defect. Um, I don't know where the rest images are. So, if, so I don't know if it's reversible or not. Okay, so um, this is the uh, at a minor technical issue. So at this point, I think Christian just answered the question. No, she does not think it's diaphragmatic continuation. Uh, she thinks it's uh, um, a, a defect on the study that's not explained by diaphragmatic continuation. On the two sets of images, you don't see much of a change, and that we added your rest images. So here we have your rest image. I'm going to comment again, Krishna. So the rest image uh, has just, it doesn't have as big of a perfusion defect inferiorly. Um, if you just compare both the supine and the upright images. So there is a reversible defect in the inferior wall in the RCA territory. So it's small infarct with uh, uh, moderate uh, degree of ischemia. So it's right. an abnormal study. So it's a, uh, at least moderate size, moderately intense, a partially reversible defect. I agree. Here it is in color. It looks uh, uh, a little bit bigger in color. Um, so you've already said you thought this was ischemia. And here, here's the uh, abnormality in the coronary angiogram. So the, indeed it's in the circumflex territory and the right coronary territory. The right coronary artery is occluded. So the point of the study is that there was a lot of diaphragmatic attenuation on this patient on the rotating images, but on a, a stress-only study, you you only want to be careful. Want to be careful calling an attenuation uh, artifact. I, uh, when I first looked at this, I was tempted to to consider it to be attenuation artifact. I was glad I got the rest images. It was fairly striking how much reversibility there was, now, especially after farm stress, where you uh, you don't have the exercise um, uh, parameters to help you uh, risk stratify. I'm going to go to another uh, spec case. A 48 year, year woman with atypical chest pain who's referred for a stress MPI. Uh, she exercised well with no chest pain. Uh, this is uh, a despect uh, uh, CZT camera. Here's stress upright. Here it is, uh, stress supine. Krishna would just say it reverses, it uh, um, goes away pretty well with the other body position. Yes. 
So what uh, I mentioned that we have a, a software program where uh, many of these cases can have a continuation correction from a CT scan that's obtained elsewhere. So really about any CT scan almost you could, will work, at least you can put it in the program. And in this case, it really helps. So here's a very nice normal, like this really, with the attenuation correction you got from the um, CT scan that was done separately, you really get uh, a lot more confidence. This uh, all the more uh, clearly looks normal. And we've had some experience, uh, here you see the, the stress uh, upright on the top, stress supine with uh, CT, separate CT attenuation correction on the bottom. You can see that you know, it can really can make a big difference. We've really been quite happy with this. Here's a, uh, the quality page. What one does is obtains a CT scan uh, separately, puts it into the software program. And we've learned some lessons uh, from doing this. So it wants to be a new uh, program, I think two, about two years now. Um, uh, with this, more patients can go st uh, undergo stress-only imaging. Uh, when the CT is obtained the same way as you would for an attenuation correction CT scan, the same way the uh, nuclear medicine study is performed, it's, it's, um, uh, works a whole lot better. So in other words, we put the arms above the head. Instead of having someone take a great deep breath for the CT scan like you might for uh, another number of scans, you do an end expiration breath hold. Uh, you take the bra off, you don't put breast shields on. There are a few technical issues. For example, some of the CT scanners in our enterprise have a uh, patient feet first versus head first. We've had to kind of figure out a way to work around those. Those were challenges at first. But a nice, uh, a nice new technology. If you're going to uh, places where you, which have the CT, CCT camera, you might um, look into uh, getting this kind of software. Um, another spec study. This patient was referred for MPI by his internist for atypical angina. Uh, he has a family history of coronary disease and abnormal EKG. He exercised nine METs, had some equivocal EKG changes. He has a stress first protocol on one of our anger camera machines uh, with a dose of around 10 millicuries. And this is the images. Now in this case, <clears throat> we get a regular um, uh, spec tomogram. Uh, we also get um, attenuation correction tomogram uh, done to a traditional fashion. And then we also get uh, computer enhanced, uh, computer post-processed uh, images, which as you see now we've got more slices and a bigger cavity because you've re recovered resolution. Um, this is the uh, a protocol we use. So in this case, we don't give uh, the high dose stress first, we do a low dose stress first, but because we have attenuation correction and advanced post-processing, more, more patients can have a stress-only image. If necessary, a full-dose scan would have been done the same day, so you'd have 10 and 30, so now you're back to the usual dose of radiation. Um, this is the advanced post-processing we do. Uh, Phillips Astonish, Astonish is the, uh, their proprietary name. He uses iterative reconstruction, resolution recovery, scatter correction, uh, and so forth. Uh, and it does allow you to uh, have enhanced image quality and give lower radiation or at least in this case, do more patients as stress only with a little bit of stress for a study. Here's an example of iterative reconstruction. Uh, what one does is one takes uh, the uh, uh, data, um, uh, starting with assumptions, updating the data with the measured, updating the assumptions with the measured data iteratively up to 100 times when uh, you do the maximum likelihood expectation maximization, uh, and that improves the image quality. This is akin to uh, the technology that the Pentagon uses to read the license plates from outer space. I'm not sure they can do that, but they take license photographs from outer space uh, from uh, satellites and are able to use iterative reconstruction to improve the image quality. We now do it. So um, in the movie No Way Out, this was done in the 1980s. There was a, a badly degraded photograph that was kind of uh, 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 revealed who uh, had committed a homicide. The movies with Sean Young, uh, Kevin Costner, and Gene Hackman, and this race against time for the strongest computers on the planet to enhance that picture uh, so they can see who it is. And the, it was a race against time to, to try to uh, prove someone else is actually the, the guilty party. And every few minutes it cuts back to this computer screen with this lines coming down and, and uh, you're seeing uh, a little better picture and finally, at the end, it shows a picture of, of, uh, of the culprit. 
Um, and that, that is iterative reconstruction, and it speaks to how heavily uh, quantitatively intense this is. So it took, in the 1980s, uh, uh, the most powerful Pentagon computers hours to enhance one Polaroid snapshot. Uh, it still takes 20 minutes with uh, uh, modern computers, nuclear medicine studies. We now have it with CT. Now the computer power is increasing further. Dr. Thompson, there's, there's a question. Um, so what percent of stress only do we, have, uh, do we do in our lab and what is the cutoff for weight or BMI to send someone for PET? <clears throat> so um, uh, we, we do about 60% stress only. I have a slide showing that uh, in a moment. Um, it varies by the site. In the rural hospitals, it's a little harder to do that. Um, we, uh, um, I do have a cutoff. So for uh, a BMI of 35, uh, we've learned sort of empirically that uh, with the um, stress uh, only on the, on the anchor cameras, the image quality is uh, challenging enough that we should just go ahead and plan to do, if we're going to do an exercise study, a, uh, a, a stress, rest, stress study, uh, a stress, rest, or rest, stress. Um, so the patient gets the usual 10 and 30 in that. So BMI of 35 is sort of our empiric cutoff. Now, when do we go to PET? Um, above about 40 is when uh, the radiation benefit managers will say, well, uh, they'll justify doing a PET scan instead of a spec study based on uh, body size and the odds of there being an image artifact. Uh, we can sometimes talk to them and say, well, the, the BMI is less than that, but this patient has very uh, disadvantaged body habitus, a very buxom woman or a man with a big protuberant abdomen. And so if the BMI is 38, 39 or so forth, we will uh, go ahead and do a spe PET. And the other times we will, uh, tend to pet is if it's going to be farm stress anyway, and we have a choice, if it's going to be uh, farm stress and there's been previous discordant spec cath results, for example, uh, those are sort of the major categories. Now, I didn't talk much about our new um, uh, digital pet camera. It will take uh, very heavy uh, patients up, up to the weight limit of the table. Um, we had been saying that above a BMI of 42 or 44, depending on the uh, life of the generator, the age of the generator, uh, that we preferred two-day spec studies over PET studies. Now that we have the digital PET camera, uh, we rethink that and actually uh, the very obese patients, the, the super morbidly obese patients can be scanned there very effectively also. We have one more question, Dr. Thompson. Uh, when would you consider spec uh, with spec CT with attenuation versus uh, imaging, spec imaging in different positions? Do you prefer one over the other based on patient characteristics? Um, so we, um, uh, we tend to use our SPEC CT camera for the more obese patients. Um, for patients whose or BMI is under 35 or so forth, we do pretty well with attenuation yeah, correction. Yeah, yeah. In the case of the D-SPEC, sometimes it performs very well in obese patients with the two different body positions, especially if we can also do the CT for attenuation correction. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna show this slide here. This is just um, uh, how we were able to lower the radiation dose uh, in our lab. Um, uh, several years ago, we were uh, given the usual uh, dosage of spec. This is the dose we've been able to achieve um, in spec. Now, our, our PET scanner dose is likewise about 2.5 millisieverts. So the the median uh, effective dose in our laboratory now is uh, uh, 2.5 millisieverts in spec or less. Uh, in other words, 50% of the patients that are studied have a, a dose that's uh, under three. Um, and if we had all of our PET scans, we'd I'd say that three quarters of the patients that have a myocardial effusion imaging study in our lab have a dose of under three millisieverts. The benchmark is nine. Uh, ASNIC several years ago came out with a statement recommending that labs have at least half their patients with a dose of under of nine or less. Nine was picked, uh, arbitrarily because the, some of the radiology societies had declared 10 and above as being high dose. We wanted to have the majority being not high dose at least. Uh, so, so it's really quite remarkable. It can be done with attention uh, to, um, to getting the dose down uh, using uh, contemporary protocols and tracers and uh, we're uh, very pleased with that. 
I'm going to jump ahead. I, I want to um, show a few pet studies as well. Okay, I've been talking about spec CT. I'm going to change gears and for uh, 30, 25 minutes or so talk about pet. Um, I'll start off with a patient. He looked uh, the same age as uh, uh, Dwayne Johnson, 43 year old, who came into the hospital with atypical chest pain and had an SVT and an abnormal EKG. He also had a bit of a murmur, which was not known before. He also had syncope, but because of the chest pain, because he'd been admitted to the hospital with a, someone who was concerned enough, he had a stress test ordered. His EKG is here, shows prominent voltage. And here's his uh, PET scan. I'll ask Christian to help me again. The sep can you yes. So looking at the perfusion images, um, the septum certainly you know is more prominent even in like the basal basal slices where you'd expect like membranous drop off. Um, you can see the RV um, and the RV uptake. Mm. Now there's definitely gut uptake down here, but otherwise. And the papillary muscles are a bit prominent also. Yeah. Uh, his flows were normal. So we'll talk a little bit more about uh, flow and flow reserve. Uh, we have a quality control program that uh, uh, Dr. Case developed for us. Uh, the quality control looks good. The flows are normal at rest, normal stress, right? Uh, the ejection fraction rose like it should. And the calcium score is zero. So this patient, I would, I mean, I would be comfortable saying that it's it's probably normal, a low risk. Um, the findings that we see are probably related to LVH, could be hokum, but probably LVH. Uh, the patient had mitral regurgitation, which I think is why we see a bit of a bright septum in the prominent papillary muscle. But um, this is a nice, confident, non-ischemic study, though. The EF goes up like it should. The, the ejection, the ejection fraction is normal and goes up. The calcium score is zero. The flow reserve is nice and normal. Um, so I, uh, when you have the multiple parameters here, it's uh, very helpful. Very, it gives you a, a high level of confidence that your study is indeed encouraging. So this patient, um, uh, as I said, normal flow reserves, rise in EF, no coronary calcium. Uh, he did have myxomatous mitral valve degeneration in three plus MR, but he does not appear to have coronary disease. Now, um, I'm sure Dr. Bateman and Dr. McGee will talk about uh, flow and flow reserve more on Thursday, but just in brief, um, what's the difference? In, we talked about flow, of course, our, our, our images or perfusion images, well, it's static perfusion. And what we've done here is we've taken an input function. You've watched the isotope come through the myocardium uh, and you add a time domain. And what our output is, is nutrient microarray blood flow per gram of uh, myocardium per unit time. So that's the difference when we're talking about perfusion. Well, it's static perfusion versus the time domain of flow and flow reserve and flow quantitation. What this does for us <clears throat> gives you better discernment of through vessel disease. If some, the magic number is usually two, the flow reserve ratio of rest and stress is greater than two. That's a positive sign, a good sign. If it's uh, less than two, then that's abnormal. And the lower it is, the higher the probability of left main or three vessel disease. And the higher the flow reserve is, the, the more reassuring it is, if you will. Um, so when we use PET in our lab, it's uh, to help detect pharmacologic non-responders. So you think about it, if someone had caffeine or, or was one of those people who doesn't respond to the coronary vision dilator stress, how would you know? Well, this might be a tip off. Uh, it does help detect severe coronary disease, so you don't uh, have uh, match defects or um, a defect that's less detectable because it's not as ischemic as another one. And the prognostic value that uh, uh, Krishna Patel has actually uh, published some very nice work on. There's a billing code for this now. This is 78434 is a January one. There's a billing code for, uh, for an add-on code for absolute quantitation of myocardial blood flow. Um, let me show a patient where I think this would, would have been helpful, was helpful. A uh, 47-year-old came to the hospital with indeterminate chest pain. He's a smoker with dyslipidemia and an equivocal troponin. Uh, he has Wolf-Carson-White syndrome and schizophrenia. And this guy, 
was a, a pain to the nurses. He was out in their space. He was anxious, and, uh, uh, excessively talkative, and just kind of uh, getting behind their desk. Uh, he did had had a treadmill test a couple years ago that was negative at a high workload, and he came in for a PET MPI, which we like to do in our in uh, our hospitalized patients, figuring the pretest likelihood is such the need to make the diagnosis higher, and it's worth doing the more accurate test. Uh, here's his. Uh, uh, static refusion images. Krishna, anyone else want to comment? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> How about uh, Diana Lopez? Diana, you're still on, Diana. You have a volunteer here, Nicholas, Nick. Yeah, hello. Yeah, Nick. Hi, uh, yeah, hello from Cleveland. Um, can you hear me? We can. Great, so, you know, the first look, um, to me it looks uh, like a normal study. Um, and uh, can I see the, like the warm metal? Color, yeah, thank you. So here, um, your flow reserve was diminished. This is, uh, here it is, 1.38. So it's normal at rest. It does not augment like it should. So the flow reserve is uh, abnormal. But as you uh, said, the static perfusion looked pretty normal. The EF did not go up. It was uh, a 65 at rest and 64 with stress. And the calcium score is 443. And this is a relatively young person who did not have known coronary disease. He was 47. Looks a little like Nicholas Cage. So what do you think? So I think um, um, that, you know, you have diffuse um, decrease in myocardial blood flow um, and uh, abnormal ejection fraction. So this is this is not a low risk study uh, in coronal calcium too. So um, I, I would based on, based on the fact that maybe the history is also limited with this patient with schizophrenia, I would, I would probably um, calf the patient. Yeah, you're right, it's a concerning study. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, when you um, call uh, on the medical house officer or the, or the internist or the nurse practitioner rounding, they, they're gonna hear the static perfusion looks good and normal. And some of the other issues here may not uh, uh, really resonate with them. So I, this is a good case to, for us to call the attending or the cardiac fellow about to kind of tell them our, our concerns. And I certainly would have gone back and uh, talked to this patient about, uh, you know, just what does this chest pain feel like? You know, what, tell me more about this now. He's a smoker. And, and so you, you're a bit a little bit concerned. Now, what happened in this guy's case is um, it's a busy Friday afternoon. Uh, the intern takes the call, tells the cardiologist that, the study's fine. They said, great, this guy's really a pain in the neck. Let's get him out of here. And, um, and then he came back in three days later with this. So here's an occluded right coronary artery. Uh, his left system was, um, uh, had some, you know, some moderate disease. Circumflexing. And, and a PCI that uh, responded. So I, I think in this guy's case, um, we thought it had to do with uh, caffeine may have interfered with the stress. It could have been that something changed, you know, the, between the uh, the pet study and the uh, and his event, but uh, um, he uh, may have had caffeine. Um, when we go back in retrospect, there's maybe a minimal abnormality, um, uh, um, you know. But uh, it was, as you said, pretty normal looking. Um, the severe attenuation coronary flow reserve and the very high calcium score uh, raised clinical suspicion, and you know, would would, would the tip off really that this is something a case you should worry about. Uh, here's just a little bit about the caffeine issue. It's, uh, it's underappreciated, I think, in a number of quarters. Uh, here's a study we did a few years ago on caffeine uh, with SPECT. Uh, it was a kind of a worst case uh, scenario. It was a um, patient had the equivalent of four cups of uh, coffee right before having a, a Regenesis and uh, SPECT study. And they had another Regenesis and SPECT study uh, elsewhere or um, another point in time. These are the ones that had a reversible perfusion defects. Uh, all of, almost all of them went down. So you had fewer defects on the second study, which was not 
uh, impaired by caffeine compared to the uh, uh, MPI-2. Um, a few patients changed, did the same, or, uh, uh, or even went up. But the, uh, there's a fairly substantial reduction in the perfusion defects you could see. Um, <clears throat> let me go on and got a couple other PET scans I want to show before Dr. Sperry speaks. Uh, here's a 55-year-old patient who came in with, uh, actually this patient came in three days ago. Um, I'll let Krishna or any volunteers look at this one in a little more detail. 55-year-old, he, uh, he had been in an emergency room <clears throat> with a cough and they, and they uh, thought it was a, um, a community-acquired pneumonia. They sent him home, but his blood cultures came back positive for staff, so he got admitted to the hospital. His white count was 15,000. Uh, he got better. Uh, he did have known coronary disease with a prior intervention to a chronically occluded LAD. Uh, and he was having pruritic right-sided chest pain, which they thought was probably from his pulmonary infection. Uh, his troponins were negative. The EKG didn't change, but his, he did he got an echocardiogram, and this showed anterior hypokinesis, which would look worse than before. And so he gets a PET scan order, and this is our uh, digital PET system. You see the higher resolution. You can see the RV um, very well in the study. Um, Chris, you want to call him a volunteer? Yes. Um, we can't hear you. Uh, you want, uh, Kashif, do you want to unmute yourself and uh, take this, please? Is that? Yes, hi. Okay. Kashif. Yeah, yeah, here, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Here it is in color. Here's in black and white. What do you see so far? Uh, could we look into the color, okay. color mode? Thank you. So it seems like there is a anterior wall uh, reversible defect on stress. It also seems like there is a, some, uh, maybe a component of TID with yep. RV uptake. Yes. Now the RV is, you can see the RV better with this um, digital PET scanner than you can with a regular spec study or, or even a, uh, our standard recently, recent PET scans. So some of that is uh, the better resolution of the instr instrument. But yeah, the, you do see the RV. Right, so th this, this kind of seems like a very high risk uh, study, okay. something involving a major uh, left main or prox LED. As you say, a big defect, it's um, mostly reversible. You've got um, uh, TID. Uh, this heart's dilated, by the way. You, you may not know from your, your scaling, but uh, from uh, our way of looking at it, we do. Uh, here's your ejection fraction is 46%. At rest and there's a 47 percent with stress this is pet so this is again this is um while the patient is undergoing uh, uh, rubidium or um, rigness and stress you're acquiring the stress images and if you look over here the the volume so if you're not sure of the of the um, scaling or just a, someone else's scan or you're not used to it you can look at this number here so an in systolic volume of 111 is quite big uh, 65 or 70 is the cutoff for being pathological. This is 111 goes to, uh, is not, uh, it goes to 120. So it does dilate even by that metric. So it's a big heart, dilates for the EF is low and does not, does not increase like it should with uh, rigorous and stress. Uh, so this, was, this was with the contours on. Here's your <coughs> quality control and flow page, the quality control is reasonable, a little bit of noise on the stress images. Um, and here your flow reserve, um, it's a little high at rest, but does not augment, especially in the LED territory where it is not augmented at all. Now, now what do you think? Yes, yeah, so <clears throat> kind of, uh, I think goes with what we were thinking, uh, either a triple vessel disease or Something involving very uh, large uh, myocardium, I would, I would still hold on to, I would say triple vessel versus left main. Uh, good, so right, so it's, it's great when all of the parameters are pointing in the same direction. Like that, the first case, uh, they're all pointing to being very uh, non-ischemic or a reassuring study. This is, 
everything's pointing to this being quite severe. The flow reserve is very low. Uh, the heart dilates. The the, um, uh, the perfusion defect is very large. Uh, it measured um, by quantitative program a total perfusion defect of 31 with stress and five at rest. So in other words, 26% of the other mass is ischemic. Um, and so what would you recommend next? I'd say high risk study, recommend CAT and... Uh... PCI? Yeah, I mean, so... Yeah, I think at least need to define the anatomy because ischemia trial didn't have, they did end up excluding left main disease. So yeah. you have to define the anatomy, either CT. I think CT angiography may not be reassuring again because of high calcium. So I think CAT would be the best option. I think everyone would say that. I, you know, we, we this is not the forum to debate the ischemia study, but oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> I have a comment. You have it as an option, so I thought. The right corner looks okay. The circle looked okay. And here's the, uh, the high-grade lesion. Actually, a severe instant restenosis in the LED. Uh, here's a blow-up of it. Um, patient had to have a, um, a double wire technique and a stent placed and got a good result. And you know, so, I, you know, the, um, the high-risk features were very high-risk. I mean, it's a nuclear study, this is a very high-risk study. In terms of the ischemia uh, trial, I would say there probably were not very many patients like this in the ischemia trial. I, the ischemia trial, I, th I think, convincingly tested moderate ischemia, but there's some levels of ischemia and risk that cardiologists are reluctant to refer patients for testing. Uh, this patient had deteriorating LV function too, so I, uh, perhaps that's a discussion for a different, a different forum, though. Dr. Thompson, we have a couple of questions. Yes, um, first is, uh, could you? Uh, describe how uh, increased lung or gut uptake would interfere with your interpretation of perfusion image. And then the second question is, um, they want you to just briefly describe what you would use as cutoffs for normal, uh, for EF, TID, um, and CFR. And the third question is, would you call TID if somebody has cardiomyopathy and a dilated LV at baseline? So gut uptake is less of a problem with PET uh, than with SPECT. In fact, I, 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 because uh, um, we uh, were discussing, I didn't get to a case that, that showed uh, severe gut uptake with SPECT. And one of the solutions was to uh, do a PET study. Um, you have a higher resolution, so you can better resolve the gut uptake. Also, this is iterative reconstruction, so you don't tend to get the ramp filter artifact in quite the same way. Um, it is a, um, it's an uncommon problem with, uh, with PET because of the higher uh, and better spatial resolution. In terms of what is a TID uh, with a PET, the size of the ventricle should be the same at rest and stress. In fact, it usually gets a little bit smaller. So 1.1 is uh, abnormal. Um, but remember, it's a little bit different than with a SPEC study. With a SPEC study, you have acquired the stress images uh, 45 minutes later or so. If the heart is still dilated, that means there's either such uh, severe subendocardial ischemia that the heart looks bigger, or that there's uh, a real left ventricular decompensation. With PET, um, the TID doesn't speak to uh, the same prognostic values as it does in respect because the, the stress images acquired while the patient is being stressed. It does confirm ischemia, though, and it, uh, it probably uh, connotes a poor progno or uh, adverse prognostic markers well, but it's a little bit of a different uh, 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 situation. Is there a third question, Krishna? I think we answer most, just like uh, normals for CFR, EF reserve. So um, why don't you answer that one, Krishna? You've done such nice work on it. So CFR, I think we discussed this yesterday. It's more of a continuous relationship. There's data that show that if it's a preserved CFR more than Two, um, two or more, then the risk of having high-risk disease is pretty low. However, uh, we can't tell or with, with 100, you know, it's not very specific, meaning if the CFR is low, that doesn't mean that, let's say it's 1.8 or, or 1.9, that doesn't mean that this patient's going to have high-risk disease. It in, the specificity increases as the value, absolute value decreases. It's, it's high if the CFR value is around 1.5, 1.6 or lower than that. Um, but uh, 
uh, that's something that we still would need to sort out um, in our data in our lab using um, our software we showed that if the cfr value is less than 1.8 uh, the risk uh, you, you you're more likely to have a benefit with revascularization especially if you have a perfusion defect um, so it may be related uh, to significant obstructive disease in some sort but there's no set cutoff for if the CFR is less than this, then you have obstructive disease versus not. Two is the kind of magic number for normal, 2.0 ratio. Dr. Uh, Thompson, uh, one more question. Uh, they wanted you to go through quality control for CFR. I think we may discuss that more in the PET session next week, uh, but if you wanted to just say a couple of lines. Yeah, let me, um, let me uh, guess, defer that question until next week, Dr. Uh, Bateman and McGee are going to uh, talk about uh, PET, and also Dr. DeCarly has a PET uh, flow discussion. So I think uh, I've got a couple of other things I wanted to show, so let me leave that one for the other day since it's going to be addressed in more detail. Uh, what I wanted to show two more PET cases, and then Dr. Spiri has some uh, cases I'd like to show, uh, but uh, happy to stop for these questions as they come along. Uh, the next patient um, looked look kind of like Sean Connery. He's an 81-year-old fellow who uh, uh, was um, uh, we were consulted because of a knee replacement. He had a murmur. Uh, he had uh, known coronary disease. Uh, he doesn't have much, much activity because of knee and back pain. Uh, he had moderate aortic stenosis in the past, and so he gets a workup. Here's his EKG, not very abnormal. Uh, here's an MPI study, the static images. Uh, sort of a theme here, looks pretty normal. Uh, his EF is flat though. Uh oh. Does not go up. His flow reserve is 1.43 with good quality control, green dots here for now. And his calcium score is 3,329. And he's got a fair amount of aortic valve calcium too, over 2,000. Uh, the echo again shows moderately severe AS. Yes. So um, this got all started because he needs a knee operation. But so the static MPI is normal. The flow reserves attenuated. The coronary and aortic valve calcium scores are high. AS is moderate, moderate to severe, 1.0. And I again ask you, what's the next step? What are people voting, Krishna? Give a couple of minutes to. We have a couple of votes for uh, clear for surgery. Okay, clear for surgery. Anybody want to cath him? Uh, yes, a few people want to cath him too. Okay. Well, he did get a cath, um, and he had moderate, uh, not 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 trivial disease. Um, uh, there was a eighty percent stenosis and no an obtuse marginal. It's not a very big obtuse marginal, and kind of a moderate disease in his LED. So medical therapy is recommended. What I, I I took from there are a couple of points I think are worth mentioning since we're talking about the CT portion of SPEC CT and PET CT. Uh, we do measure the aortic valve calcium in our routine coronary calcium scores, which are oftentimes done as part of MPI studies. Uh, this is mild calcium, 807. Here's moderately severe at 1900. And here's very severe at 7,750. 7, uh, this is a merging metric, kind of a secondary adjunctive test for aortic stenosis. Uh, somewhat helpful in, uh, when the echocardiogram is uh, uh, borderline or equivocal. Um, we measured, here's uh, some guidelines that have uh, adopted the aortic valve calcium score uh, in the uh, European uh, uh, Commission. Um, here's their uh, flow algorithm just down here. If, if someone has, uh, you're trying to distinguish between uh, severe low gradient aortic stenosis versus moderate aortic stenosis. Uh, they have uh, an algorithm for dobutamine echo and a, a corner, a, an aortic valve calcium score. Uh, here's the numbers they recommend. The numbers we found have been a little bit lower than this, but if aortic stenosis is greater than, excuse me, if aortic calcium is greater than 3,000 men, or even 1,600 in women, that's almost certainly severe AS. If it's greater than 2,000 in men and 1,200 in women, it probably is severe AS and it's less likely than these numbers that are listed here. Again, the numbers we found have been a little bit lower than this. Um, 
I'm going to jump in. There's one more patient I want to show you just because I think it's such an interesting discussion. Uh, <clears throat> uh, this is a 67-year-old patient who came in with syncope and, asymptomat and, and, and symptomatic bradycardia, the low-level troponin rise. Um, he'd been taking propranolol for migraine headaches. He was not able to get an MRI because uh, of an experimental ear implant. Uh, his uh, echocardiogram showed left ventricular hypertrophy and normally if he had had some hypertension. And here's the uh, MPI study. I would like some help with this one. So, Krishna, any volunteers? Yes, Rana, you want to take this one? Rana from B Boston. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, thanks for volunteering. Okay. So, um, the resting images look fine. Um, on the stress images, I do see mild to moderate entroceptal reversible perfusion defect. Can you change it to the um, color? Yeah. Oh, great. So yeah, I do see moderate actually. I think there is some fixed defect, um, kind of gets worse with stress in the entroceptal, basically septal region from mid to basal. Yeah, sort of a funny distribution, isn't it? It's, uh, it's, it's partially reversible. The apex is spared, but uh, the anterior and interceptal segments partially reverse. Kind of, kind of curious there. Yeah. Um, same goes for the heel layer. Yeah. So we tried to do flows. There was a technical problem. The flows were non-diagnostic. The calcium score is zero. Uh, the EF did go up well, appropriately. So um, the guy had syncope and heart block. <clears throat> um, I think we should do a cardiac cath. Syncope, heart block. You know, MRI would be a better option or um, FTG PET. Yeah, he, um, uh, I've, I've got to restart here. So his, um, uh, uh, he could not have an MRI because of the, um, this experimental ear implant that he had. Uh, so but either ways i think um considering this syncope heart block bradycardia maybe fdg pet would be a better option yeah maybe so well i got a cardiac cath um because the reversible defect it looked funny Um, and his coronary calcium score is zero. There was that funny reversible defect. And uh, the coronary angiograms looks pretty good. Um, and uh, the interpretation from the uh, interventional cardiologist was the stress test appeared to be a false positive. And uh, so here's the follow up the patient um, was discharged, the pranolol was stopped. Two weeks, two weeks later, he had a symptomatic bradycardia and a pacemaker was placed. Uh, five months later, he had further problems in diastolic heart failure and runs of VT and saw an electrophysiologist. The electrophysiologist ordered a test. And what was the test you wanted to do? FTG PET. There you go. Now we're talking. Now here we have the FTG PET. Can you help us here? So it's rubidium on top and FTG on bottom. So uh, the area where we were seeing the, the, the reversible perfusion defect, and you can see on the FTG pet there's an uptake, which is consistent with active disease in that territory? Actually, yeah, classically positive for um, sarcoidosis. As you said, there's a, a, a defect in the resting rubidium study, uh, which takes up FTG um, avidly. So you've got matched um, perfusion defect with metabolism. Uh, indeed, this made the diagnosis of sarcoidosis, which uh, you, you noticing that he had um, heart block or had passed out, um, thought of that immediately. Um, someone looking at a, a report for a stress test and doing a coronary angiogram might not think about it. Uh, here's the color, it shows a little better. So I, 
I think um, in this case, it speaks to the importance of looking at your studies and think of the whole case, right? If, uh, if um, the rounding cardiologist had looked at the MPI, looked at the cardiac cath, uh, thought about this, um, they might have thought, no, there's a reason. This is not just a motion artifact that, that makes the MPI look funny. This is a, um, this is a funny looking MPI study. Uh, given the clinical scenario, uh, the diagnosis could have been made sooner. Now the patient was subsequently placed on steroids and an ICD and did well. Um, but uh, a very good for you for thinking of that and picking it up. Folks looking at the case in a less than comprehensive fashion uh, I didn't think of it right away. So very good. Any questions, Krishna? Or? One question was that if we go back to the initial images, there was a defect only on stress, not at rest. Was that what the case was? Right, so um, you have a, a defect that looks worse with stress than rest. In retrospect, that's related to a circulate. And then uh, they wanted to know if there was any extra cardiac involvement that was identified on the CT that was done for attenuation correction. In retrospect, uh, oh, um, uh, you know, I don't remember. In retrospect, it was not on the um, MPI study. In the rubidium study, I mean, the FTG study, I believe it was not. Red Spiri. Dr. Spiri, do you want to take the screen? Uh, Dr. Brett Spiri, I mentioned this. Well, he got a cardiac cath because um, the reversible defect, it looked funny. Um, and his coronary calcium score is zero. There was that funny reversible defect. And uh, the coronary angiograms looks pretty good. Um, and uh, the interpretation from the uh, interventional cardiologist was the stress test appeared to be a false positive. And uh, so here's the follow-up. The patient um, was discharged. The pranolol was stopped. Two weeks, two weeks later, he had a symptomatic bradycardia and a pacemaker was placed. Uh, five months later, he had further problems in diastolic heart failure and runs of VT and saw an electrophysiologist. The electrophysiologist ordered a test. And what was the test you wanted to do? FTG PET. There you go. Now we're talking. Now here we have the FTG PET. Can you help us here? So it's rubidium on top and FTG on bottom. So uh, the area where we were seeing the, the, the reversible perfusion defect, and you can see on the FTG pet there's an uptake, which is consistent with active disease in that territory? Actually, yeah, classically positive for um, sarcoidosis. As you said, there's a, a, a defect in the resting rubidium study, uh, which takes up FTG um, avidly. So you've got matched um, perfusion defect with metabolism. Uh, indeed, this made the diagnosis of sarcoidosis, which uh, you, you noticing that he had um, heart block or had passed out, um, thought of that immediately. Um, someone looking at a, a report for a stress test and doing a coronary angiogram might not think about it. Uh, here's the color, it will show us a little better. So I, I think um, in this case, it speaks to the importance of looking at your studies and think of the whole case, right? If, uh, if um, the rounding cardiologist had looked at the MPI, looked at the cardiac cath, uh, thought about this, um, they might have thought, no, there's a reason. This is not just a motion artifact that, that makes the MPI looks funny. This is a, um, this is a funny looking MPI study. Uh, given the clinical scenario, uh, the diagnosis could have been made sooner. Now the patient was subsequently replaced on steroids and an ICD and did well. Um, but uh, a very good for you for thinking of that and picking it up. Folks looking at the case in a less than comprehensive fashion uh, I didn't think of it right away. So very good. Any questions, Krishna? Or? Uh, I think 
one question was that if we go back to the initial images there was a defect only on stress not at rest was that what the case was right so um you have a, a defect that looks worse with stress than rest in retrospect that's related to a circlet and then uh, they wanted to know if there was any extra cardiac involvement that was identified on the CT that was done for attenuation correction. In retrospect, uh, oh, um, uh, you know, I don't remember. In retrospect, it was not on the um, MPI study. In the Rubidium study, uh, the FTG said, I believe it was not. The cardiologist <laughs> in the group, our right. uh, expert, has a special expertise in nuclear cardiology, including circuit and amyloid imaging. And, uh, Brett's going to share some cases now, too. All right. Can you guys hear my audio? Yes. All right. So thanks, Dr. Thompson. Um, great talk to start this off. And thanks to ASNIC and Dr. Dorbala for, uh, for allowing us to present some cases here. Um, I'm going to take a, uh, a little bit different, uh, switch gears a little bit here. So I'm a uh, heart failure transplant cardiologist. Um, and a, a nuclear imager here at St. Luke's in Kansas City. And so I thought I would um, use some of my interest to, to spend the last 40 minutes or so, uh, 35 minutes talking about um, uh, indications for combined hybrid imaging, spec CT and PET CT imaging, which was our, our topic today, but really make it a case-based presentation um, on nuclear imaging for heart failure. So the first part, I'm gonna just do a few cases on amyloidosis, and I know Dr. Durval is going to talk about this next week as well. So I'm not going to go into as much detail uh, as she will about everything. But uh, there are different protocols for imaging in amyloidosis, and I, I want to try to make the point here that I think SPECT and SPECT-CT are needed for pyrophosphate imaging in amyloidosis, and that is recommended in the guidelines currently. So first case here, 54-year-old African-American male. Um, uh, Sorry, this, yeah, here we go. 81-year-old mother recently diagnosed with hereditary ATTR cardiac with V122I mutation, asymptomatic, exercises daily, no red flag symptoms here, carpal tunnel, biceps tendon rupture, spinal stenosis. Um, I'm just going to skim through just a couple slides about what is amyloidosis. I think most of you know this already, and Dr. Dorbala, again, is going to go over this next week, but protein misfolding disorder. Uh, there are different types of amyloidosis. We care mostly about ATTR and AL uh, in the cardiac world. Um, <clears throat> AL is light chain uh, amyloidosis. Uh, ATTR is transthyretin. That's uh, from made from the liver. Here's the diagnostic algorithm that, that I think most people end up using, and, and this is something for sure to commit to memory for the fellows. If you have a clinical suspicion of amyloidosis, you do have to order both sets of studies looking for AL with the serum free light chain ratio, uh, serum immunofixation and urine immunofixation, and then the pyrophosphate scan for the ATTR. And then uh, additional parts of the algorithm go from there. And Dr. Durbal again is gonna talk about uh, this great uh, set of expert consensus recommendations uh, in documents, um, part one and part two. The second part here is on appropriate use criteria. And you see our patient who has a TTR gene mutation. We do think it's appropriate to order PYP imaging for this patient. <clears throat> so our protocol, we use 10 to 20 millicuries. Um, uh, and we, uh, there are different protocols out there. One hour, planar image, anterior LAO and lateral spect image with or without CT is considered recommended in this most recent document. And then three hour images, uh, it says in the document optional and recommended if there is excess blood pool activity noted on the one hour images. And again, planar inspect. So I think, um, <clears throat> uh, okay, so this, this slide is looking at the semi-quantitative score, which um, again, we'll go into more detail, but zero, one, two, or three, I think a lot of people are familiar with these at this point with relation to rib uptake. And then the, that's at three hours. And then the heart to contralateral lung ratio is at, uh, validated on the one hour images um, predominantly. And that's drawing a ratio over the heart and over the contralateral lung. Uh, 
counts over the heart and lung and then taking a ratio. And a number of 1.5 on the one hour images was considered consistent with uh, ATTR. So the old paradigm here was looking at the planar images, semi-quantitative grade at three hours, HCL at one hour. And the new paradigm, which, um, which uh, we're trying to put forth is to uh, look at the SPECT images and really um, number one, visual interpretation, evaluate planar and the SPECT images to confirm that there's radio tracer uptake in the myocardium. So this is our patient. Um, <clears throat> what do you guys think? What, what grade do you think this is? Zero, one, two, three, don't know. So people are saying three mm -hmm. other answers here. Yeah, so pretty much everyone's saying three. So I would say that, um, you know, when you look at these uh, and you grade against the ribs, a good way to differentiate the rib versus the heart is on the, the lateral images here. So use all your images that, that you have available to you. Um, <clears throat> uh, the, remember the grade is, is validated on the three hour images. So um, I think you can also say, don't know, don't know what the grade is going to be because these are on the one hour images, but certainly there is, uh, there is a lot of myocardial uptake here and it looks uh, above that of the rib uptake. The ratio here we got was 1.6, but then when you look at the SPECT images uh, with few spec CT here, you see that all of this uptake is in the blood pool. And this is a pretty dramatic case. Uh, and Dr. Amala showed a similar one yesterday where there was a lot of blood pool uptake. Um, uh, we didn't necessarily, and he, his patient had a low ejection fraction. We didn't necessarily uh, uh, find in our cohort that blood pool uptake was that related to ejection fraction or kidney function or anything like that. It's just um, uh, for whatever reason, sometimes these patients have a, a lot of blood pool uptake and the SPECT is very helpful to differentiate that. So second case here, 88 year old male diastolic, diastolic heart failure, pacemaker, AFib, CAD, as echo showed septal thickness 1.3 and posterior wall thickness. Here's his, uh, planar one hour. So what do we think the grade is here? One. People are saying one. Yeah. <clears throat> um, great. So yeah, I think um, this is an interesting one um, because what else do you guys see here? Obviously, there's there's focal uh, rib uptake in several spots. So is this confusing things for us a little bit? If you look at the lateral, um, <clears throat> so grade one, you would say that this is not consistent with ATTR, right? Uh, on the lateral, and uh, if there is myocardial uptake, sometimes you see this donut where uh, the, the center kind of clears here. So you, you are wondering a little bit about this, if this is going to end up showing myocardial uptake. Um, and then here's another question where, when you do the ratios, how are you gonna draw the ratios in this case? A, B, C, or D? C. D, D is what everybody's going with now. So yeah, I would say D here. Uh, the, the issues here are obviously this rib uptake. And uh, so you, you do want to avoid the rib um, as much as you can, this, these two hot spots. So you, for the heart uh, circle, you want to make something more like this. Uh, even for the contralateral lung circle, you have two hot spots right here. Um, so you, you do want to avoid these. Um, sometimes people have a very prominent diaphragm that comes quite high and, and if possible, you can avoid that. But th this is how, um, uh, we say to grade these obviously too. And then the other thing is right ventricle. If you see a huge right ventricle uh, that comes out uh, on the right side of the chest, um, that may have some cardiac or blood pool count. So you want to try to stay away from that if you can. This ratio was 1.48 when we did it uh, on the right. So here's the three hour images. 
I agree. I mean, this is, this is either at the, at the level of the rib or, or uh, probably around the level of the rib. This ratio was 1.54. So you do have some discordant findings here, um, but you end up seeing myocardial uptake on the SPECT images on both the one hour and the three hour, and it's, it's, it's fairly similar. So you, are, you do think this is in blood pool and this is actually uptake into the myocardium. But when you when you see that when you see this and it's less than the rib or kind of borderline, you do want to obviously think about uh, other things like specifically AL amyloidosis more uh, more in the front of your mind. And and here, the we made sure to check the kappa lambda ratio. Obviously, that was normal. The immunofixations were normal. This patient ended up um, not having a further workup of this and got sick with another illness, um, and then ended up ended up passing away that was kind of unrelated to this, but, um, but we presume that this is ATTR cardiac amyloid, either earlier type disease or lower than expected myocardial counts because of all the focal uh, rib uptake. Again, the other thing that was mentioned a few times in case reports were hydroxychloroquine cardiomyopathy, and this is at long-term dosing of hydroxychloroquine, not the you know, COVID uh, weak, weak dosing or whatever uh, they're, they're trying for the COVID. This is long-term, you know, 10, 20 years of hydroxychloroquine uh, that can lead to these potential findings. So third case here, 70 year old man referred for consideration of advanced heart failure therapies, palpitations, AFib, worsening symptoms, unable to tolerate goal-directed medical therapy, he had red flag syndrome, symptoms, carpal tunnel, bicep tendon rupture, spinal stenosis. It's very sick here. Heart rate is elevated, blood pressure is low, JVP very high. Um, here are his planar images, and I'm not going to ask the audience necessarily because this is pretty obvious that um, there's significant uh, uptake here in the heart. Here's the SPECT image, which looks uh, you know, almost like a poor quality uh, MPI here. So this patient uh, was very sick, low cardiac output, and um, uh, we actually ended up transplanting this patient. But the point that, the reason I bring this up is if you look at uh, the uptake, what, what we um, noticed is, is that uh, you do normally, if you have early uptake, usually it's in the septum or in more of the basal segments, and you can have some apical sparing. And I know we talk about that in echo, um, but you can have some apical sparing uh, like this. And we think that that, for whatever reason, uh, that is a marker of earlier type disease. But when you see more uh, disease that is diffuse, then, uh, then that may be more significant type disease. And this patient had uh, diffuse uptake here in the myocardium, and he, he obviously was very sick. So here's another case. Um, what do we, this is just a, a quick one of the SPECT. What do we think, po positive or negative? Positive, I'm assuming people are saying on the chat. Um, <clears throat> here's another set of images. What if I told you that this one was at 10 minutes? And then this one was at one hour. So um, this is obviously not in the guidelines, and this is just we're just studying this now. Uh, but um, when some patients were with uh, one of the other European tracers were studied, they found that myocardial uptake happens very quickly, and so um, maybe SPECT will help us uh, push this time frame earlier and earlier. Again, not something we recommend doing. Something we're currently studying. So. To summarize this portion of, uh, of um, amyloidosis, I just wanted to say that I think SPECT with or without CT is necessary for pyrophosphate imaging um, for multiple reasons. Number one, to rule out myocardial uptake for equivocal or positive planar scans. Number two, to rule in myocardial uptake in the setting of equivocal or negative scans. Evaluate diffuse versus focal versus apical sparing. Um, uh, and then it may help with diagnosis and prognosis and then potentially move to even faster protocols. We need more, more data here. Um, <clears throat> I see some highlighting on the screen here. Um, 
And then, Christian, any, any additional comments on amyloidosis here? I don't know who's highlighting, but maybe they can. Uh, no, no comments. Be removed. Um, okay, and again, Dr. Dorbala is going to be talking about amyloid in a lot more detail here in the upcoming days. So here's a, another case, 67-year-old male, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, admitted for palpitations, AFib with RVR, baseline troponin was a little bit high, increased, converted to sinus rhythm, a PET MPI and an echo were ordered. So here's the PET scan. Um, does, someone, does someone want to take this from the audience? If not, it's on you, Krishna. <laughs> looks like there's some TID, but otherwise it looks normal. The perfusion looks normal. Mm -hmm. And then the flows. Are decreased diffusely mm -hmm. everywhere. Yeah, so kind of an inter interesting case. The perfusion uh, images look pretty normal, but um, you know there there may be uh, a little bit of TID here, and the ratio ends up being around uh, 1.2. <clears throat> and the the flows are diffusely low. Um, EF was 47, calcium score was two. So, you know, what are we going to do with this one? Uh, we get the echo back, and this is what the echo looks like. Is there a way to like blink? I don't know. Um, <clears throat> so there's some LVH here. I don't know if this bottom echo image is, is playing very well, but you kind of visually maybe see some apical sparing. You you have the mitral inflow here and the, the tissue Doppler. Um, not too bad as far as E prime around six maybe seven for the S prime. <clears throat> we check kappa and lambda light chains here and, and uh, there's a uh, obvious abnormality in the, the lambda here and uh, there's a lambda monoclonal protein. Uh, this patient had a fat pad biopsy that was consistent with AL amyloid lambda um, biopsy met criteria for multiple myeloma was treat, treated with cyborg D, underwent stem cell transplantation, and then uh, and then had had recurrence. So, um, so I think this is this is an interesting case. And uh, patients, um, I would say to the fellows, uh, no matter who you're seeing in the nuclear lab, you know, um, think about amyloidosis even for the MPI studies, uh, especially if you have ancillary information to look at, like the um, like the echo images, and uh, uh, we, we see some low re low flow reserves in amyloidosis. You can see it both both in AL and ATTR, but um, I've anecdotally seen it more in AL um, that can be consistent with microvascular disease. And I think this person did have a, have a little bit of TID, and uh, certainly had had globally low flows. So something to think about there. Um, so I'm going to switch gears and then talk about. Uh, some imaging and LVAD, um, but before I do that, any questions? Uh, the, there's a amyloid? question about fat pad biopsy. Fat pad biopsy. Yeah, so um, the fat pad biopsy is helpful for AL amyloid. For ATTR, uh, it's not very helpful. Uh, wild type is only about 15% of fat pad biopsies are positive. And then for hereditary ATTR, it's higher, but not much. Um, think around the 30 to 50% range are, are positive. Um, the fat pad is, is pretty good around 85% around positive in AL amyloid. So, um, you know, a hematologist is not going to treat AL unless there is uh, tissue, right? Uh, tissue confirmation, tissue diagnosis. So you need to get the tissue somehow and, and the fat pad's the easiest way. So we usually start with that. Um, if there's any question or any concern, you obviously go to the organ at uh, in question, which in this case was was the heart, um, but yeah, we usually start with the fat pad if we can. Um, 
And this patient did not have any amyloid in the bone marrow, which uh, is usually the case. Uh, you can stain the bone marrow with common red, but um, even if there is amyloid, it's not always infiltrating um, into the bone marrow and, and causing the, uh, the amyloid fibrils there that will stain with common red. One other question. Mm -hmm. uh, do you expect DID commonly? No, I think this is a, you know, this is just an example of um, you're seeing something funny on the pet that you can't really explain. And I think it's explained by the amyloid, but certainly um, not, uh, I wouldn't say it's, well, so number one, I don't, we don't, um, you know, there's not a huge amount of overlap between MPI studies and patients with AL amyloidosis. Um, but in the ones that I've seen, um, there's not, you know, you shouldn't expect TID uh, but if you if you do see TID in low flow and you think it's real and not just artifact, you know you should you should think about why that is happening. Um, and almost everyone has an echo, and, and this echo uh, was at least concerning enough for amyloid to to go down the route of um, considering it. And, and sure enough, that's what uh, this guy had. Okay. So last 15 minutes or so on LVAD imaging and uh, um, let's see, there we go. Got rid of that squiggly line there. <laughs> okay, um, so just to orient people and I think most people are familiar with this, LVADs have, um, are used for advanced heart failure um, you can have an LVAD as a bridge to transplantation, heart transplant, or an LVAD as destination therapy, where that's uh, going to be what the patient is going to have going forward without an idea for transplant. It's a surgical procedure. Um, the inflow of the LVAD gets cut into the LV apex. Um, the blood comes from that inflow in the LV apex. It goes through the main pump of the LVAD, and there's different different LVADs, and we'll look at those in the next slide. And then uh, there's a rotor or impeller, impeller there that um, shoots the blood out through this outflow graft that gets anastomosed up in the aorta, and it shoots blood out in the aorta and then to the rest of your body. This is powered by a power cord called the drive line. The drive line connects to the ho main housing of the LVAD. It comes out the skin. This is the driveline exit site outside the skin. And then the driveline connects to this controller. The controller has all the, the, um, the, the buttons on it basically and a screen that gives you what the flow is and the pulsatility index and the, the power and everything, RPMs. This then is connected to batteries that the patient usually wears or can be plugged into the wall. So this is the basic concept of an LVAD. Um, These are different LVADs. This is, you know, the, the uh, old first generation HeartMate XPE. And we went to HeartMate 2 and then uh, HeartWare came up with HVAD, which is a lot smaller. And then the HeartMate um, uh, company, Thoratech came and uh, made a HeartMate 3, which is around this, between the size of a HeartMate 2 and an HVAD. Um, you could see these, these look different. And so um, when you're looking at pets, FTG pets for infection, you know, knowing what kind of pump they have and where everything goes is important. So there's complications to LVAD, RV failure, pump thrombosis, aortic insufficiency, GI bleed stroke, but driveline infection is what we're interested here uh, in nuclear, um, nuclear cardiology. And uh, this is what some drivelines look like. These are some examples of quote unquote clean drivelines where you can still have some erythema um, around the driveline exit site, it doesn't always look exact, entirely clean, but then you have more infected drivelines that uh, can have uh, purulent drainage or uh, just more violaceous borders there in some of these. Um, so then on to a few cases. So this is a 59 year old man, HeartMate 3 implanted for non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. He was admitted to the hospital with brown drainage from his exit site and left-sided chest pain under the LVAD, afebrile, white counts normal, blood culture is normal. Wound culture showed MSSA. And uh, this is, um, we, we 
this is embedded in the PowerPoint here. So, um, so this will scroll through a few times, hopefully, but you can look at the fused images here. On the top is just the CT, middle is, um, is the FTG portion of the image, and then the, the fused is on the bottom. So what are, what are people seeing here? comments from the chat. Mm -hmm. So I, I understand that some of these may be choppy, so I put some still images in here. So um, the first thing I want to point out is on the top, and you can see as it's scrolling through, but there's a lot of subcutaneous FTG uptake here. Uh, when you look at these, there's, there's usually two sets of images. There's, um, there's a uh, attenuation corrected and, and, and uncorrected images. Um, it's important to look at both sets of images, uh, particularly around areas of the LVAD because uh, there can be major artifacts, obviously, when you use the attenuation correction um, and the drive line and the outflow graph. So really look at both sets of images, but um, but look at the uncorrected images. And these are the, um, what, I'll, what I'm showing you here throughout is the uncorrected images. So there's a lot of uptake here in the subcutaneous tissue along the drive line, but this doesn't really make it into the chest cavity um, or into the, and you can see down there, or into the actual pump body. One thing that you will notice on some of these is, um, if you remember what this HeartMate 3 pump looks like, you know, it, it gets sewn into the LV apex. And around the sewing ring, you can see some mild amounts of FDG uptake here that are around the suture pledges. These are, these are usually not concerning um, and not consistent with infection. So you do see that on a lot of these studies. So I don't think that this is a real finding, but certainly all of this stuff um, in the subcutaneous tissue is a real finding and, and he needed an incision and drainage of this um, and uh, a debridement of uh, a bunch of um, infected tissue he got IV uh, Keflex for six weeks. He had improvement in his pain and drainage from his wound. His wound ended up closing and he's on chronic suppressive treatment with Keflex. Or Cephalexin. Um, so another case here, 61 year old man, heart made three, prolonged hospital course here, steroids for adrenal insufficiency. So uh, high risk for infection, obviously, acute kidney injury requiring dialysis. Candidemia two to three months after LVAD treated with ibuconazole and then boriconazole was readmitted a year and a half after LVAD with fever, hypotension, shock, stabilized. PET was ordered. This is the exit site, which actually looks pretty clean. And here are the scroll through images. Try to play this again here for folks. Well, I don't know if it's gonna go again, but um, here's what we see on the on the, fr the frozen pictures here. So the, the first thing is the, this is the whole outflow flow graph, and I tried to get it into a good axis here, but um, you can see there's a lot of uptake here around the, the outflow graft, which is concerning for, for an infection. Um, there is this area around the ring that I showed before that uh, may not be as concerning for, for uh, infection. Um, but again, in the red arrow here, you can see this, uh, this uptake here. And then there's a little bit of FTG right at the exit of the drive line here in the skin, if you can imagine. Um, there we go, this is playing through again. Uh, you, you sometimes see that. I mean, it, it could be early after LVAD, you know, um, there can be some uh, inflammation there as things are healing usually for, for six to eight weeks um, as the drive line 
exit site is is healing and there's um, uh, that really gets anchored into the skin but after that you you shouldn't have a lot of um, should not have a lot of uptake in that area so there could be there could be a little uh, a little issues there um, uh, but this does not track all the way into the into the body so Yeah, so we thought that this was an infected outflow graft from Canada. And the patient on this admission did grow Canada, got IV ambisome uh, for a few weeks while inpatient transitioned to PO voriconazole. Another case here, 64-year-old female, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, heartware, LVAD, cardiac and systemic sarcoid requiring steroids. Um, Progressive dizziness and increased capture thresholds on the RV pacemaker lead, frequent VT, was then admitted with fevers and weakness, blood cultures were pending, uh, no, no other sources of infection that we saw. So a, a PET here was ordered for a couple things, for fever workup and also to see if there was anything going on in the myocardium. Uh, for sarcoid, obviously, it would be difficult. It's going to be difficult to tell for sure with an LVAD, but... Um, this was her driveline exit site, which did not look too bad. So here is this pet. So I'll let this run through one more time and then show you guys the, uh, the images here. So um, <clears throat> we thought this was very concerning, um, again, for, uh, for uh, LVAD infection um, that was associated with uh, the proximal portion of the outflow graft. Um, and then the, the first um, first about half of the outflow graft. And you can see examples of this here um, in the three different planes. So this patient, um, this patient was very sick, ended up becoming septic and, and actually passing away on the same, same, uh, same hospital admission. So this is, this is obviously a big problem when these LVADs get infected. I think this is the last case here. This is a 21-year-old um, female, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, heartware, LVAD as bridge to transplant. She had driveline drainage, wound culture showed ESBL, E. coli, carinobacterium, blood cultures were negative. Here's this one again. This is the un these are the uncorrected images. Um, uh, some of this, uh, you know, liver and spleen uptake uh, goes away. A lot of it goes away when you look in the corrected images, um, but you do see some abnormalities here. So as you're going through, you, you can see the, the drive line here. And then around the LVAD pump, there's something, and then maybe even up here in the, around the ICD. So the first, first part of this that I want to show you is the um, the drive line. So you can see a lot of FTG uptake here with the arrows. And in the second set, you can see uh, again the uncorrected images around the LVAD pump, and this is in a different area than the, the, the sutures there. So this is, this is very concerning. Uh, and then there was a small abnormality right outside of the, uh, the ICD pocket, and this wasn't a new new ICD, so you're, you're wondering as well if, if there's uh, some infection going on up there in the ICD. So this patient um, has been on suppressive, this has been a long course now for about four years, has been on intermittent suppressive antibiotics, PO and IV has required intermittent driveline debridements, um, and uh, uh, really not something that it can be medically managed well or cured once you start to get infection in these uh, in this this durable um, mechanical support uh, that you have in you we have a couple of questions yeah 
So the first is is PET a standard part of workup for diagnosing elder infections in uh, your patients. The second one is when do you repeat an FD, FDG PET after treatment of infection, and the third one is about reimbursement for inpatient. Okay, so um, is it a standard standard treatment? I would say, um, or standard diagnostic. Uh, I would say that if you just have someone who has just drainage from their drive line and they don't have other systemic symptoms, then we don't necessarily do an FDG PET for uh, infection um, on those patients. If you think someone has more a systemic infection, certainly if they have uh, positive blood cultures. Um, or, or fever, leukocytosis, requiring them to be admitted to the hospital, you are concerned more about a systemic infection, then yes, we, we move to FTG PET, usually as an inpatient. Um, and uh, one question was about reimbursement, and that's maybe that's, uh, <laughs> that's more for Randy, but um, Dr. Thompson, but I think that uh, reimbursement um, for you know, inpatient, we can just order these, these studies. Um, outpatient, it, it is difficult to get these reimbursed. Um, uh, similarly with sarcoid, at least in our area, it's diff difficult to get these reimbursed, yeah. particularly by the Medi yeah. Medicare and Medicaid um, populations. Uh, and then what was the, the one question? The question is, is PET better than uh, white blood cell tax scan? So that's an interesting question. Um, and there is a lot of debate on that. Um, uh, I, you know, the, I think some of it comes down to, to preference, and I know different parts of the world do more tag WBC scans, and um, in different hospitals, you know, may not have PET or may not have tag WBC scans. We, we don't have a, a great ability to do tag WBC scans here, so we, we do all the do all FTG PETs um, for for our patients when there's a concern here. To, to comment just briefly on the reimbursement picture, yes, when someone's an inpatient, the hospital gets paid by DRG, and so it's it's not a big issue. Uh, but if they're, a patient's an outpatient, um, there's a negative um, national coverage determination that's uh, about 10 years old, actually more than that, for PET for infection and inflammation. Uh, we put in an application to have that sunsetted, in which case the local Medicare carriers could then uh, make their own decision, and the, and the, the literature for FTG imaging for sarcoid and for infection is overwhelming. And so presumably we'll get that one uh, improved in, in, uh, during this year, at least that's the, yeah, that was the expectation, so. Um, was there another question? It sounds like that the hour's up and this has been a great audience. I love the, love the questions that were sent in. Love, uh, uh, sh um, Randy, Sharmila here. Um, really great presentations from you, from Brett, and uh, thanks to Krishna as well. Uh, really amazing cases. And um, just to let you know, today was Good Friday and you still had uh, over 300 people and more than more than 255 to 60 at this time. So that speaks to how they enjoyed the session. Great. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you all for joining. We hope to see you next week. We will try to minimize overlap in topics and um, probably on Tuesday, We'll cover a little bit more on um, cardiac masses, vasculitis, pediatric imaging, or other topics which have so far not been covered. So with that, um, have a good weekend, everyone. Happy Good Friday and happy Easter. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you, Camilla. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.